It has literally been two and a half years since I completed the first draft of this movie. Yes, that includes part one. For those of you who don't know, this is part two of a stop motion movie I released in April of 2019. This thing was originally meant to be a single traditional stop motion film, although after a year of working on it, I ended up splitting it into two parts, cutting it right in the middle. I could also go even further back if I wanted to. The actual script itself evolved from a simple fight scene animation between a Jedi and an Inquisitor into a fully fledged first draft 22 page script. After I released part 1 though, which was 16 minutes long, I went through the rest of the script and I did some changes, which ended up making it 25 pages long. So in the end, what was originally a simple few minute, not even fight animation, evolved into a 41 minute two parter movie. So basically, it's been a long project. The original idea was going closer into depth into Order 66 and how it affects a clone trooper and, and a Jedi relationship. It's something we never really got to see in the movies or even the Clone Wars. Well, that was at the time though. That was three years ago. Now we have season seven, which does exactly that. And I'm sure many of you noticed the similarities. So after I finished part one, I don't even remember how I started on this, but I started to wonder if doing the second half in Blender was a viable option. I had a lot of issues working within the limits of stop motion. And so the supposed freedom of 3D animation was very appealing. One thing I didn't want though was to make one of those super unrealistic 3D animations that looked nothing like stop motion. I wanted to have it feel like part one, at least a little bit. So after a lot of time experimenting, I managed to get pretty close. And that's about the time when I released the John Wick animation. That's when I realized I could do it and then it was possible. And hopefully it'd have it at the level I had in my mind. Before we dive into all the 3D stuff, I wanted to give a quick rundown of all the changes I made after finishing part one. And I'm talking story-wise. One thing I definitely wanted to do was make a more compelling story. I didn't feel like part one really managed to do that, probably because it had to be cut right in the middle and it never really had an end or a conclusion. So what I did was I went through the script, added scenes, I removed scenes, I changed dialogue, I changed the ending, I did a million changes or in order to better flesh out the characters. For the character of Mraz, I decided to give him more of a purpose. In part one, he lost his Padawan, so evidently he wants revenge. But revenge is a pretty simple story. One thing that's huge with the Jedi is that they always tend to be very reserved, not letting anything make them angry or fearful or emotional. So Mraz is the same way. So even after losing his Padawan, he tries real hard to stay true to his Jedi ways, but ultimately it's easier said than done. So what Mraz really wants is to prevent what happened to Gilly from happening again to his troops, but that didn't go so well. The other two characters I really wanted to flush out more was the rookie, Jax, and then Sledge. Jax being a rookie newcomer, simply wanting to make something of himself as a Republic soldier, and then Sledge being a more experienced soldier who knows the horrors of what Jax has yet to experience. So in both cases, they're equally naive, and again, it doesn't go so well. So after all that, it went from 15 pages to 25. To be honest, I bit off more than I could chew, but it was a fun year and a, and a half, so what the hell. Now, let's get into the technical side of things. Where did I even start with all this? Well, that would be building all the sets. One of the biggest upsides to 3D is the unlimited supply of LEGO. And thanks to Mechabricks, I didn't even have to do any modeling or materials. Without Mechabricks, this literally would not have been possible. Well, it would have, but I'm too lazy to do all that. So thanks, Mechabricks. Basically, all I did was build sets in either stud.io or Mechabricks, and then exported that set from Mechabricks into Blender using the advanced add-on you can get in their shop. With that, all the materials are taken care of. You can check uh, out my more in-depth tutorials for a more, uh, better explanation, but they're pretty outdated, unfortunately, now, though still helpful. I may make a newer version in the future. The same thing goes for the characters. And I would take the textures of these characters into Photoshop in order to do anything custom, like the clones for example. All in all, this is the easiest and quickest stage of the process. After that, it's animation time. I went through like three or four different versions of a minifigure rig, starting with a super basic one I created myself, then finishing off with the epic fig rig which you can download for yourself for free. I'll put that in the description. The amount of work it, it saves you is actually the same. For those of you who are more familiar with animating in stop motion in real life, 
I think you'll be surprised at how similar it is in 3D. It really didn't take me long to figure it out, and thanks to interpolation, call me lazy if you want, but it helps you out. Then facial animation was tricky at first. I really wanted to improve from part 1, which was clearly a bit of a rough job. So I attempted to make my own system in Blender, but couldn't really get it going well. Then this happened. Mechaface, made by Citrin's Animations. It's an add-on that does exactly what I wanted, but way easier and way more free than I could have ever done myself. With it, you can make custom faces, animate the mouth, eyes, and eyebrow shapes with bones just like a regular rig. Basically, to make a custom shape, you just edit the plane in edit mode, and then you are free to move it however you want. After that, to save even more time, I went through and then made pose libraries for each character. Different poses for each sound and also different tones. That way, when animating, I didn't have to make a pose each frame. I could just click on a button and it did it for me. So let me give you a quick rundown of the process or workflow I used to make a scene. The production process. Basically, once I had all the dialogue recorded, I edited it all into a single audio file and then brought that into Blender. After that, I began what's called the blocking stage. Simply put, what I would do is I brought all my characters into the set then with simple keyframes, usually only on the master bone, I planned out the animation. Basically, I would make a blueprint of where the characters would be, where the cameras would be, how long certain movements would take, and you literally create your movie without doing any fancy animation. And so once that's, once that's all complete and you're happy with the scene, now it's time to go through and do the real animation. This is of course the longest process. But if you do a good blocking, it can save you hours and hours of animation. Once that's all done, I will go through and animate the faces using MechaFace, going through frame by frame and listening to the audio I imported, along with the pose library I created. It's tedious, but what isn't? After that, the character animation is complete. But I would go then go make some fine adjustments to the camera, making sure I like the angles, making any movements look less interpolated and computer generated. And what I did quite often in this film was to add a noise modifier to the location and rotation of the camera in order to get that handheld look. What's also important was the focal length and depth of field. I would usually keep a longer than 50 millimeter focal length in order to replicate that long zoom effect you see in stop motion films because it's obviously miniature. And I would go also set a super low aperture, something like 0.01 to 0.04. I found works well. Keep in mind, real life aperture values aren't comparable to this because in Blender, these models are so huge, so you can't really base that. In order to get the right focusing, what I did was I created an empty, and then I animated that empty wherever I wanted the focus to be. Then if you set the focus object as this empty, it will always be focused on the empty, so you can have it wherever you want. Super simple and easy. Once you've done all that and are happy, it's lighting time. Usually I do lighting before animating, but it could be smart to do it after once you know all your camera angles. Lighting in itself is a complex topic, so I won't cover it too much. What I would normally do is add an HDRI, then add some extra area lamps for some more customization in the lighting. Like everything else, it just takes practice to get right. After a thousand test renders, I might be happy. For compositing, this is where I would add any saber or blaster effects. You can take a look at my node tree here. I will also attach it in the description for anyone who wants to create a similar effect. For blasters, all it was was a simple emission material, and then in the compositor is where the actual effect is made. For sabers, because a motion blur was a bit more complex, I ended up making my own node setup for this, which involved turning on motion blur in the render settings, then turning off motion blur for every single object in the panel, except for the sabers. Uh, Jambo made a script that does this and for any selected objects, so that was a lifesaver. Both these nodes are in the description and I may offer a more in-depth uh, tutorial explanation in a future video. Then I often added some mist and some glare and started the rendering. This usually takes a millennium, so while one scene rendered at night, I would start setting up the next scene. Another option for faster rendering is a site called Sheepit where you render other people's projects and then they render yours for you. This is a fantastic service, but sometimes you can get a few frames that are buggy. All you gotta do is reset those and then have another user render it. If it wasn't for Sheepit, this movie would literally still be rendering. So after all this, how does it all compare to traditional stop motion? 
There are many advantages to both. In 3D, you don't have to worry about bumping your set or running out of Lego, but you do need a pretty beefy computer to run all this. And there's also something nice about that tactile feeling of animating in real life. Is one or the other faster? I'd say animating in 3D is significantly faster, but with all the other stuff you have to do, including render time, probably makes it pretty even. The biggest advantage for 3D is the possibilities. There's way more freedom for your vision, and that's why I prefer it. Now let's shift a bit. I'm going to let the mastermind behind the film's soundtrack talk a bit about his process for scoring. Since this was my first time composing music for a film, even before I started scoring music for particular scenes, I started out by writing themes for the characters and ideas represented in the film. That way, I can use these ideas as a roadmap to help guide me through the score. One of the more prominent themes in the film is Jax's theme. You hear Jax's theme a lot when Jax is on screen, and you can hear it develop throughout the story. It starts out very vague and very subtle, but it develops into this full orchestral sort of grand moment during the fight at the very end. Jax's theme also never quite resolves until the very end when Jax dies and his journey is finally complete. Mokar's theme is also heard a lot in the film. It represents Mokar and his hatred of the Jedi and his need for revenge. You first hear it in the opening scene when Mokar's family is killed and it develops throughout the film. The 313th theme was the hardest one for me to write. I really struggled with coming up with the right notes that represented the military aspect of the clones, but also had the ability to be heroic and feel like Star Wars. I also wanted to be very similar to the clone theme used in the Clone Wars, so after a lot of experimentation, I ended up trying to take the same notes used in the clone theme and change the order and the rhythm to create something different. So the beginning part of the 313th theme actually uses the same notes as the clone theme from the Clone Wars, but it's just slightly rearranged. Once I was able to get this idea down, it was a lot easier for me to add on to it and flush it out into a complete theme that you can hear in full during the clone preparing scene. I only mentioned three of the five themes that I wrote for the 313th. If you're able to find the other two, let me know and, and you'll get, well, you'll get nothing. But I, I might be able to ask Owen to shout someone out in the comments if you're able to find them. Anyhow, to actually write the music, I used Cubase and various sample libraries to try to get the orchestra to sound as realistic as possible. If you're interested in music production, especially for orchestra, here's a list of some of the main sounds I used. If you're starting out, I highly recommend buying the East West Composer Cloud package because it exposes you to a lot of great libraries that you can use, and it's very, very cheap compared to most sample libraries. Like I said before, this is the first time I ever composed for a film or a story like this, so there's a lot of room for me to improve and I have a lot to learn. Um, my only hope is that every scene is better than the last one and my writing improves for every film that I work on. That about wraps up the music section of this behind the scenes. Uh, if you're interested to know more about the music and, and how it was made, um, you can find me on Discord at Jambo. Um, you can also check out my channel, maybe listen to the 313th soundtrack. I got some more music that I'm currently working on, and if you have any music that you want to hear, you can let me know. I, I might I might give it a try. Um, but other than that, thanks for listening, uh, and I'll see you guys later. That's pretty much it. Hopefully you enjoyed that behind the scenes info. If you did, maybe consider joining my Patreon. The more support I get, the more awesome content I can make. And I do have big plans for the future. And I have so many more stories I want to tell. Hopefully I can tell as many of them as possible. <laughs>